We will head further on, and um, I'm really um, lucky and, and honored that we have him uh, next on stage. Uh, he is uh, the lead game designer of a game called <laughs> Shards of War, uh, which is the newest uh, first client game of the company called Big Point. Everyone should know the company Big Point. And he worked uh, uh, on uh, certain other gaming titles, just like PlayStation All Stars, the battle version, and. Um, Right now, this is his project, a mobile genre, or a mobile game, a free-to-play game. So actually, this is something that could be fitted to uh, Peter's um, topic. And um, yeah, he will talk about the game itself and maybe the chances and uh, possibilities about Shards of War and why good ideas don't make a good game. Please welcome Al Young, lead game designer at Big Point. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Hello, hello, is this on? All right. Well, you've heard some very smart people talking. Unfortunately, it's my turn now, so I apologize. Um, so, as Daniel said, my name is Al Yang. I'm the lead game designer on Shards of War at Big Point right now. Um, what this basically is, it's a mobile game. Uh, I know it's not a very crowded market right now, but I think we can do pretty well here. Uh, I basically, I come from a sound and music background. I was actually studied uh, music in university before moving on to Taiwan and working as a sound designer in uh, MMOs there, and then coming back to the United States, going back to school, before moving on to companies like THQ, where I moved to China for a few years, and worked in the Chinese MMO industry, and then PlayStation All-Stars in the US, and now I'm at Big Point working on uh, Shards of War. So here we go. So I'm here to basically talk to you today about how good ideas don't make good games. So all of you guys, the previous talks have been kind of more kind of a high level, kind of talk, kind of like kind of the broader sense. I'm going to get down kind of the nitty gritty more into the systems right now. So how many of you guys are like game design students or designers or like really into games? Could you raise your hand just to kind of see a show? So this will be more relevant to you guys, everyone else. I apologize. I have some more specific examples in here. But this is basically one of the biggest fallacies we're seeing in game design today, which is, hey, hey, this is a good idea. This is a good idea. Let's put it together. Doesn't always make the best thing. So the key points I'm basically talking about today is something I call design divergence, which is basically trying too hard to be different. You see this a lot, especially in indie games, where you're like, hey, we have to be different just for the sake of being different. You see something I like to call the everything pizza, which is where we say, is, does a positive and a positive actually make a positive? This is a big deal. Complexity, just because this is, is more actually equal better. You see this a lot in mobile games, too. They do a very, very good job with this. And then borrowing. But is it a bad thing? All right, so let's start off. So, Mercury, this is the game, as you see, Shards of War, the trailer you saw earlier, is actually based off of this game, um, which came out at Big Point about a, uh, I'm gonna say, last year, it went to open beta, you can kind of take a look at it. Pretty close to what you're seeing here. Camera, gameplay, pretty similar. But unfortunately, this game did very, very poorly. Um, it was basically brought on to kind of take a look and see what went wrong. From the outlook, it actually doesn't look that it actually doesn't look that different at all. Yes, there's some things different there, but for the core thing, we're basically looking at a very, very close game. So, moving on. This is where things start to go wrong, so I'm gonna give you a lot of very, very specific examples here. Um, actually, raise of hands, how many have actually heard of Mercury or played Mercury? All right, I'm sorry, it's okay. <laughs> Hopefully you guys give the new game a shot. Um, but these are the things that basically went wrong with what we have here. So design divergence, this is again, strength too far from the norm. I'm trying to be different just to be different. Have you guys have seen this one? This is basically Brutal Legends, one of my most anticipated games when it came out. Beautiful looking game, great story, great scenario. I think it tried a little bit too hard to be different. This is one of those things where you basically just, you have a really strong core and you just keep adding on top of it. In this case, those are kind of the RTS elements here for you guys familiar with this thing. But then you see cases of this where this actually works very well. If you guys have played Borderlands, I mean, what makes it really different from any other shooter is they basically took a really strong, basically, progression system, which was the, basically the Diablo progression system. They put it in a shooter. It was gold. It was something that hasn't been done before. But again, I don't think they were trying to be different just to be different. They're trying to be different because it made sense in this case. And even then, you think this applies to kind of big games, because I'm be talking about big games. But this applies to indies everywhere also. So Journey is one of my favorite games. And you look at it, and you actually think really closely about it. What's different about this kind of game? Well, the, the gameplay is really close to actually stuff you've seen before, platforming, kind of adventure games. I mean, the controls, camera, everything. 
What they really innovated here, though, is basically with the communication, how you communicate with other players, how you're basically interacting with, the other, with players, not just the world, but mostly players. And this is what made this game very interesting. I like to use food, maybe you can kind of tell. Um, what they do here is kind of like when you're trying to do design diversions, it's like, hey, I like burgers, I like hamburgers, I'm gonna try to introduce you a new food. It's like, how about try this salad? You're like, no, that's not really my kind of thing. But at this point, you'd be like, well, have a cheeseburger. Here's a cheeseburger with bacon on it. Maybe you add some lettuce, pickles, tomato, special sauce, all that kind of stuff. You're still getting the core experience. This was that burger, but you're not diverting too much from what the player actually expects and what they're actually used to. You get them something totally different. Oftentimes, it actually works out very poorly. So this is where it comes down to expectations. Resident Evil 5, you guys played this before. Resident Evil is a shooter, is a survival horror game. People aren't really sure about it, what it isn't. It's not Resident Evil. This is why this game tanked pretty badly back when it actually came out. A lot of the fans were very disappointed in this because they didn't know what to expect. Fan expectation is just as important when you're kind of diverging from your base game design. And you take a look at stuff like this. This is a Nippon Ichi. They make a lot of very weird games, and you're like, well, this is very strange. You're like, who would play this? How can they keep making this stuff? But that's what we're talking about. It's for a very specific audience. They know what they're building for. They know who they're building for. They're not going to divert from that. They're not going to put these serious kind of horror stuff in there, this very kind of keep it kind of crazy, keep it kind of lighthearted, because they know exactly what the expectations are for the fans. Sometimes this thing kind of goes awry. Destiny, something I haven't been able to stop playing for a while. Um, same thing here. That's why you see a lot of polarization here. People like say it's good, people say it's bad, but again, it's not built on if it's actually good or bad. It's built on the expectations on what people expected. They expected basically MMORPG because it was built as that, and basically that's where you get kind of get the divergence in what people are actually thinking. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Merc Elite in kind of terms of what happened there. So this is one of the maps you saw from the video, which is our game mode, map design. So we have deep and complex maps. Yes, that's great. We basically called this game, the, the tagline was a top-down battlefield. However, it was pitched to players as a MOBA. Now, actually, how many of you guys are familiar with the MOBA genre or like MOBA games? Okay, good chunk. So, unfortunately, what we basically did was we built games for the wrong genre. Or we basically already built levels for the wrong genre. Now, how did this happen? Like, what, this, what impact did this actually have? So, basically, this is basically one of our maps from Merc Elite. You can take a look. It's a pretty standard map compared to a map from like Call of Duty. Pretty similar design, just kind of looking at it. Look, maybe a little map from Halo. Also pretty close compared to a MOBA map, looks a little bit different. And when you basically take a look at other MOBA maps, you start to see a trend in what they're doing with the shape and the design of the map. So we basically took a step back and we're like, okay, we diverged way too much here. Basically, this is one of the things we're like, okay, trying too hard to be different because we want to be basically a new type of MOBA. So we had to ask ourselves, what is this MOBA genre? It's basically a single map. It's a mode developed over a decade. And this is where people do this kind of thing when they diverge. They don't think about the consequences as much. They just do it because it's cool if they want to do it to be different. But a lot of these things actually, because of the, the systems of the game, every little piece connects to every little piece. Just because you add something here to patch it up, it's probably going to start affecting something else somewhere. So Aeon of Strife, the original, this thing's been around for a long, long time. It's, and this, because of this, you just can't take it. and You can't just change something and it'll just instantly work. So we basically talk to ourselves, what's the core of the MOBA? Progression, clear structure, goals and strategy, constant engagement, PV elements. I'm just going to go through this quick. Strategy, strategic safety, something that this kind of map doesn't really have at all. So just to give you one example here, on a traditional MOBA map, we have your clear structure. In order to get to the enemy's base, you have to take down these structures, these towers in order. So you always know you're not going to go all the way in back door into his base. You have to go one after another. So the front line of the battlefield is always very clear. With kind of a domination style, kind of like first person shooter map, you're not really sure. I've captured point A. Well, I mean, what's next? C and B are not captured. Which one do I go to? What's the right decision? It's very tough for players to make these decisions. And for the mobile players, this is kind of what they expect. So that's just like one example out of there. So, I mean, the other thing is if you look at domination kind of modes and look at other mobile games that have done it, it's like, hey, Infinite Crisis, even League of Legends are really one of the biggest uh, mobile out there. They did it, they failed, and they had a lot more of those things in there. And it's because of the same thing, trying to kind of diverging way too much. On the same time, though, when you do smart divergence, you get really interesting things. So this is Witcher Battle Arena. They also do a domination style game mode, but they did one thing very differently from all those kind of domination maps you've seen in MOBAs. Basically, I can stand at one point and see the other point. At this point in time, there's, you don't have that question anymore of where do I have to go, what the next spot is, because 
if you're standing on one, you can see everything else. It's very, very clear. So moving on. Shards of War. What did we do to fix this? The first thing is you kind of see our map. We've diverged. We basically went back to kind of our key MOBA map. And like I said before, with kind of the burger example, if you tell someone you're going to give them a MOBA, there's certain things they expect. You, can, you have some leeway. You have some play. Like Eric said, you can kind of move around a little bit. But the thing is, if I say here's a burger and I give you a salad, you're going to be pretty pissed. But if I give you a burger and there's like cheese, bacon on there, you would be like, OK, I'll try this. And hopefully, maybe you'll like that a little bit more. You'll give you something different. That's the key to all of this kind of stuff. So basically, we kept the same kind of classic mobile map. But yeah, we innovated on there. We added some new things in there. And then since basically it looks like a top-down shooter, it plays like a top-down shooter, we made it a top-down shooter. And here, basically, what we, did, we didn't innovate in what the core game mode is. We basically innovated in how you play it and basically what the controls were. And this is something that no one's really done before besides kind of the sci-fi element. And like I said before, the mobile market is very, very, how I say, it's very packed right now. League, Dota, Smite, there's a lot of very, very big guys out there. It's very tough to stand out. But again, you can't just make stuff to be different to be different. It has to make sense. It has to flow. It has to feel natural. And with the top-down series like the old Smash TV, Alien Swarm, that kind of stuff, this felt like the best thing to do. We did it. We tested it. Oh, you always prototype this stuff. And it worked out. The game is actually in open beta right now, so if you guys are interested, you can go and take a look. But like Peter kind of said earlier, what we're trying to do here, as you can see with all these esports kind of things, you're not trying to push a lot of money in it. You're not trying to push a lot of players at once. It's a living product. You keep going, and you fix things kind of step by step. Basically, we putting it out there, testing the market, fix, slowly fixing things, and letting the fans basically build this thing for us. Because the thing here is the thing is, especially with hardcore games like this, you can't force fandom. You have to build something that people like, encourage them, fix the things that they see wrong, and have the fans basically push the games out for you. So, again, small changes, big impact. For those of you guys who play shooters or whatnot, you look at this kind of stuff, and you say, "Hey, one's Halo, one's Call of Duty." To your average player. It's the, it's the same thing. One's in space, one's got aliens, one's not. All right, same enough. But the thing is, there's some mechanic changes in there, small enough that basically make these games totally different. And this is the type of spaces we're looking at in Divergence. Enough so that the players, the burger fans, will still get their burger, but it's different enough, but it's still a burger. And this is the key to kind of this design divergence. So, next thing, maybe you can tell I like food. I call this thing the everything pizza. Chocolate. I think most of you guys agree it's pretty delicious food. I mean, it's basically a royal food for the longest time. Some people don't like it, but it's pretty good. Pizza, also pretty good food. I would say it's in the top 10 of foods, maybe, somewhere up there. But it's pretty good. I don't think people say it's a bad thing. However, you put these things together as they are, it quickly becomes very disgusting. All right. And we're not talking like dessert pizza. We're talking like this kind of chocolate on this kind of pizza. You can mix stuff if you want, sushi and milkshakes, whatever. The thing is, good things, good things don't always make good things. And this is, a big, this is a very big problem you see in game design these days, especially, and you see there's a lot of indie games, and you see like titles like Hybrid, MMO, RPG, RTS, FPS, Shooter, and you're like, wow, that's a lot of cool things together, but is it actually good? If you take a look, just look, you find tons of this, these examples. So what happened to us was the tier system in the old Merc Elite. So if you guys have ever seen World of Tanks, this is what basically the tier system looks like. It's basically kind of like a leveling system for you guys. Uh, keep it simple. And you basically, there's numbers. Easy thing to remember is the higher the number, the stronger your tank is, period. It's just going to be stronger. So works for World of Tanks. Great. It's also a very good monetization thing. Uh, so that's why it's in our game, or it was in the game. So let's take a look at it between Merc Elite and World of Tanks. First off, this is, they just put it in because it works there, it's great, they're making tons of money, so we should use it. Basically, that was what happened there. First thing, 15 versus 15, 5 versus 5, already the median, the ability to kind of like even that, those players out, already three times greater. They have a thing which is permanent damage, we have respawn because we're a MOBA. What this basically means is World of Tank, I have a tier 1 tank and a tier 3 tank, and I fight you, and I do like 50 to like maybe 80% damage, I feel really good about myself, I'd be gone, I'd be dead but I've done some real permanent damage. In Merc Elite, what happened was basically, I'd go and I'd shoot you. I, may, I might be a tier one guy, I might take you down. You're like, at 20%, I die. I'm like, wow, I did really good. I'm a much better player than you are. But by the time I respawn and come back, you've basically regen to full. There has been absolutely no impact had. It's also a big problem. They have new unit progression. We have same unit progression. This is every time you tear up, you have a new tank. With us, what happened was, every time you tear up, it's just a new guy. It gets an extra skill, extra ability, extra like a bag on his belt, did not work. It just made things more complex without actually changing the utility of these things. 
which is what this next part is, shifting utility, like if I was going to a game as like a lower level tank, I could still do useful things like scout, uh, basically tell them what, like basically scout, um, figure out like communications, see where the enemy was, like decoy, et cetera, et cetera. With ours, we had a static focus. If you're a damaged character at tier one, you're a damaged character at tier three. It doesn't matter. If you're a lower tier, it just means you suck harder. And this is actually one of the bigger things that a lot of people actually forget, which is it's the only of its kind at this point in time when it comes out. People attribute too much stuff to basically saying, hey, it works here, it must be good, but they forget to take into account, like, well, are there any other really competitive, like, tank games out there that in this space? No, well, is it really because of this system or is it because these are the only guys occupying this space? You're st I, like, now you go into mobile, you're seeing this more and more, but again, it doesn't, sometimes you gotta take a look, it doesn't always work because it's good, and it works because it's the only one occupying that space or it's the only one dominant in there, so. If you don't follow this, you get basically you get gimmicks. On the worst case scenario, you get something like Bioshock 2, like multiplayer. It's not bad, it's tacked on, you don't need it, you didn't ask for it, but it doesn't hurt the core experience. Worst case scenarios, you get something where you get an adventure game, for instance, where you just have to, every, you have to attack a lot, but every time you attack, you have to wave your arm. And that gets really tiring really fast. Super, super, super worst case, you destroy the core. So this is Company of Heroes Online. Uh, any of you guys play Company of Heroes, anybody? A little bit familiar? All right, so this is the online version of this. Worked on this at THQ in China, where we launched this. And something that happened here is basically, we sold units, and we sold units you could only get in the store, because it was good monetization. That's the way monetization should be done. Um, as you know, for RTS, this is like playing StarCraft, and like you're like, well, you want stim packs for your Marines, then you gotta buy that, sorry, man. It basically destroys the entire balance of the game. And this is the kind of stuff that happens when you just kind of have a, have a mandate for like monetization, et cetera. So you have to be very careful because all these pieces connect together. You basically have to be very careful about how they interconnect. It's not just about just the mechanic stuff, but the monetization can affect this really, really greatly. I'm a big fighting game player. Street Fighter Cross Tekken came out last year. Community is dead. Same reason. Put in some just randomly put in some monetization in there. People went back to play Street Fighter 4. It's like five years old now, because it's not competitive. They basically destroyed the core, the expectations of what that game was supposed to be. So, something I call square pegs and round holes, this is where you, you, just, you just can't force this kind of stuff. China's actually getting very, very good at this. We saw this when working uh, over there. We worked basically with Tencent with Shanda. With the game design, this is Dungeon Fighter Online, making come back to the West, but they do this kind of stuff very well, where it's very natural how the, basically the monetization basically flows into the actual game. All the mechanics work together very clearly. I don't have too much time to talk about this, but I recommend you guys take a look at this if you want to see how this kind of stuff really works. Or King of Combat is the big one. It basically uses the same stuff as uh, Street Fighter Cross Tekken, but it's hugely successful for Tencent in China right now. It's because of the way they integrate their monetization into the mechanics with the expectations of what the players are getting. So you can research that kind of stuff. So what we did, character tiers, how did we change this? World of Tanks. First thing is, I know except, especially for historical tanks, you don't really get much visual difference between them. But on top of that, what you get is, again, we went over this again, new units, you have utility changes, you can change the equipment, so you can change speed, weak spot, signal range, sight, all this kind of stuff. Stuff you can't do with a mobile character. Because basically when you're building a mobile character, between a first person shooter character and a mobile character, it's very different. Um, like on, you saw on the domination map, uh, you can run in and you, as one person, I can kill like a group of five people. No problem. I'm like, I'm really good. I'm actually more skilled than you. I got a grenade. I can headshot. Medic can do this with a pistol. Not a problem. Because MOBAs are based on RPG characters. You can't do that. Everyone has a very distinct class. Healer is not going to be able to kill three damage characters. He probably won't even be able to kill one damage character by himself. So this is one of those things where you have to actually have to take these very small systems into account. Again, and as you tear up, it doesn't look too different. But again, with the RPG style stuff, I hate to say, if you give a wizard a gun, he's still a wizard. All right. You give him a shield, he's not going to be out there tanking stuff. It doesn't work like that. So, these are our old character tiers. You saw the tanks and how they tiered up. This is basically literally five characters from the old game. So you would have to work really, really hard to basically get that extra belt or the extra grenade or the armor, which you can't see because the camera's pulled up over here. And as you add to these things, you get more and more abilities. So things became more and more complex. It wasn't just fun, it was just, just complex. All right. So the character art, it's like, yep, he's getting more and more clothing as he's basically going up. So basically what we did, I'll show you some of the new stuff we did, basically changed this to new characters. So these are some of our new characters. Um, we really kind of, really kind of, kind of flesh them out, make them different, actually make them stand out from each other. It's not about leveling up one character, it's about leveling up multiple characters and kind of scaling them out. 
All right, and how do we do this is kind of we shifted the, the, uh, all the kind of the leveling into our equipment system. So again, same character, different play styles. This is very important for us. It's about metagame diversity, which is what you saw in World of Tanks. But what we're doing now is because we can't attach to the character because each character has to be unique, has to be different. You have to attach it to kind of items. So you may have seen this before, like Magic the Gathering, like kind of the League, uh, sorry, the World of Warcraft Old Talent Tree, even League of Legends. I'm just one character, multiple, multiple different equipment builds for them. Some better, some worse. But this is basically where we added diversity. And the thing is, sometimes you get players and end up with shit like this. And you know what? That's OK. There's a really good quote I like, which is, you have to give the players the rope to hang themselves with. We can't do it for them, all right? This actually, you see this Diablo in all these like uh, MMORPGs with the talent trees. It's like there's always the best build. The thing is, and if you're a power player, you're always going to go for that build. You have to minimize the obstacles for people to be like, well, if you're just going to go online and look at this build, all right, that's fine. But you have to give them basically the choice to kind of do kind of very strange, very interesting things. Because this is how basically you have interesting play in your games. Is again, you have to have play in your systems. You have to have a little bit of leeway. The people want a power game, the power game. The people want to find really trolly and weird builds, they're going to do that kind of thing. This is what makes these item systems and MOBAs so great, really. And the thing here is, like Minecraft, like all these kind of games that have uh, these building blocks is what we're really doing as game designers, you shouldn't be giving, taking the choice away from your players. You should be building modular systems. You should be building building blocks. You should be building tools for your players to kind of make interesting decisions for themselves. Of course, you're going to be thinking one way, but again, those testers at your door, which is your players, they're going to figure out way more stuff than you've ever imagined. So you want to make it as modular and clean for them to discover this kind of stuff. And if it's too broken and it doesn't work, that's the thing about live games. You keep fixing it, you keep patching it, you keep improving it. So. Complexity for the sake of it. So this is XCOM Enemy Unknown. Sorry, this is the, uh, the shooter version. Same deal. It's like, hey, do we actually need this kind of stuff in there? We'll actually make it better. This is our next point. Well, it's an XCOM game, so of course you're going to have commands every three seconds. Works in a strategy game, not so much when you're trying to play an action shooter. This is a really good example I like. Same deal here. Smash Bros., if any of you guys have played it, one of my favorite games of all time. It's still a fighting game. It's still fun. It's still action-oriented. But they're, take, they're telling themselves, hey, lower the barrier to entry. Is it when you have to do 30 button presses to throw like one move, is that actually fun? Or is it just complex for the sake of being complex? They take this out, and I think they do a very good job with it. But again, at the very end, I'm not saying don't make complex, but you have to really figure out and build for your audience. So Dark Souls, very good example. This game is super complex. All right, there's so much random shit going on in here. But is it a bad game because it's complex? No. It's the same thing like the Nippon Ichi stuff we were talking about earlier. They know exactly who they're building for, so they build this type of game. You don't even want to see me drive, so you don't want to see me play Gran Turismo. Same deal. Like, I don't know what, this tire, what tire pressure actually does for my drift, but the same deal here. They're not trying to build your average racing game. They're trying to build a simulator for a very particular audience. And again, when you're looking at the games, that's what you should be building for, for your audience. If you're going to make it complex, make the complexity right in the areas, not just complex randomly. All right, and this is where you go, build for your audience smartly. So this is a really nice quote from Henry Ford, which is, if I ask my customers what they want, they would sit a faster horse. All right, this is referring to cars, of course. And the thing is, yeah, this is who was smart about this. He wasn't just saying, well, I'll just build, you know, like I'll build a carriage that carries six horses or something like that, or like maybe we, make, we like breed horses that swim really well. No, this is like, hey, we want, we know what our customers want, but the thing is, do we just give them the same thing, or do we want to, we basically figure out what the core of what our customers want, and then basically kind of build and build around that. Think about, they don't know what they need, but we know what the core of what they need is, and you build from there. So, I think you've seen this video already, I'll play it again. At the end of all that, this is what happened with Shards of War. You see the map, you kind of see kind of the lane gameplay, we add a lot of the classic MOBA stuff in. Our big divergence stuff, sci-fi, that was the main thing, it's like you have all this stuff which is, uh, Kind of very fantasy you're like okay what's what's the easiest thing to do there kind of get a very strong kind of sci-fi feel this wasd run and gun kind of action all right and just one small mechanic by just changing this one thing you get a lot of lot of different things in there which is kind of like shot blocking and kind of like juking that's very very different from the classic one loadouts this is kind of our item system I explained earlier we basically have these jungle minions we basically automate a lot of stuff which is basically kind of like lowering the barrier, like in the League of Legends or something, if you take the bear and you take basically a, a buff, you have to do something with it. With ours, basically it's like when you take it, it basically automatically helps you out with basically lowering that barrier of entry. There's still smart things you can do about it, but then you actually have like a much, much easier time understanding what's going on. A little bit more gameplay. 
as you can see we like we brought back the nexus the goal is still very clear you basically have to go from tower to tower until you get to the end so this thing is if you're a mobile player and we found this out basically looking at the data and our initial we've been out for two weeks now and a kind of limited release we found out basically like hey the people that come are the mobile players they don't even play the tutorial they just go straight into the game and they start playing because they understand what's going on what they need to basically take a look at is basically the controls the divergent stuff is the core game is the same they're getting the burger with, they're trying to figure out what this cheese is, trying to figure out what the bacon is, but they understand exactly what they're getting. And that's the key thing. I think that's why we're having success in this right now. So, final point I want to talk about today is kind of borrowing good ideas. This is one of the biggest problems I think we face designers right now. Because quite honestly, we, we're just human beings. We each have our own preferences. We get easily caught in this. I like red, I like blue, we, let's argue about it, all right? Is one of us right? Is there a reason? Maybe it's just self-preference. A lot of us forget to take a step back and actually look at what you're building. Maybe there's mandates in there. You have to put this in there. You have to have this kind of monetization system in there. You have to be careful, though, because is it actually good for the game? Don't ask if it's good for you. Ask if it's actually good for the game. Is it good for your audience? Who are you building this thing for? But quite honestly, this is also one of the best things to do. And honestly, like, all I can tell you guys is steal as much as you can. All right, There's no shame in doing this. But the key thing here is make a statement. Make it yours. If any of you guys have seen Kill Bill, I grew up with a lot of the Shaw Brothers kind of kung fu movies growing up, and I love this kind of stuff. When I saw this movie for the first time, it was like every single kung fu movie I've ever seen mashed together. Was I pissed? No, it was amazing. The thing is, what Quentin Tarantino did is like, yeah, he appreciates this stuff too. There's a base to build on, there's a foundation to build on. You take it, you make it yours, you present it in your own voice. That's the key thing here. It's like, like there's so many shooters out there. You're gonna make another shooter, you're gonna make another mobile, you can make another fighting game, you're gonna make another action game, etc. There's so many out there but make it your own, make it your own voice. More recent example, Guardians of the Galaxy, if you've ever seen the original comic and you watch the movie, it's like a lot years apart, but James Gunn basically did that. He took it, he made a statement, he made it his own. But again, make sure you know what the impact is, because like one little small change turns the whole game around. From the outside, it doesn't seem much, like the trailer you saw for Mercury, trailer you saw for Shards of War, doesn't look like much, but it's a huge difference for the players there, especially if they're burger connoisseurs. They know what type of food that they like, and they have very particular tastes there. So. Again, don't force innovation. Last example, regenerating health in Punch-Out showed up in 84. Didn't really happen until 2001 for shooters. That's like 17 years. But what it did there is it totally revolutionized how shooters work, revolutionized basically the uh, kind of like the combat mechanics there, the, especially the encounter systems. You didn't have to slog through a very long kind of like boring fight, boring fight, boring fight, really high-paced, exciting fight. You could basically keep it going all the time with this kind of regenerating health thing. Then it moved to RPGs. Look at Final Fantasy 13. look at Dragon Age 2 totally changed the way that basically you go through like the boring fights up to like kind of the dramatic boss. And then you look at this kind of now with the divergence and FIFA Club Manager, Destiny, half these things is like all half RPGs. Now you, pick up, you play sports games these days, it's half an RPG, all right? They're not forcing it, it's very natural because you're, they're taking a look at where the innovation is leading them, what is automatically interested in these players and they're basically pulling that in there. But again, build on top, be innovative where you can, but most importantly, be innovative where it makes sense, don't force it. So, I'm going to leave you with a quote from one of my most inspirational heroes. So, this is a challenge to all you designers out there, that you should want to be the very best, like no one ever was. You have to catch these problems. That's the real test. To solve them should be your cause. I'm Al Yang from Big Point, and uh, oops, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Al. Right. Nice.